Hello, and welcome to another episode of Balanced Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to reintroduce to you now. Sarah Keogh is a returning guest on our show. Be sure to check out her first appearance on our podcast on episode 233 of Balanced Body Radio. Sarah Keogh is an eco-nutritionist who began her career in ecological work in her home state of Colorado and now practices full-time as a clinical nutritionist in Maryland. She supports patients with a wide variety of health conditions, including digestive issues, autoimmune disorders, heart disease, diabetes, and cancer. Educating patients on the value of nutrient-dense foods from local farmers is vitally important in her her practice, as this is an essential component of the healing process for each and every patient. By utilizing advanced functional testing with her patients, Sarah is able to identify key nutrient deficiencies in order to get to the root cause of their conditions. Sarah is passionate about connecting her patients with local farms to source their food, as she truly believes that the regenerative farmers are the real healers of the planet and play a pivotal role in restoring human and ecological health. Sarah Keo, what an absolute honor it is to welcome you back to our show. Thank you so much for having me back. I'm so grateful to be here. Absolutely. It's great. Last time we did this, we didn't have video. Our, our, right. um, our, our, basically, our Wi-Fi signal kind of sucked. It's gotten a little better, so it's nice to do this on video. We understand you've got some slides for us, which is super exciting. Yes. Very cool. That's <laughs> awesome. Well, can't wait to deep dive into what you've been up to lately. We had a great conversation earlier this year, um, and it was so cool. When Jane Buxton's book, The Great Plant-Based Con, came out, I, I it came out of nowhere for me. Like I just saw it one day on Twitter, and I bought it. I got the audio book so I could listen to it immediately and what an enjoyable experience to hear all the names of all of my friends all these people that I've connected with and your name came up and I'm like oh my goodness you're in this book it's so cool so great to see you here you made my day too I think I was having a rough week that week and I was like what I'm featured in someone's book okay man I felt so honored and then I looked you know got the audio book right away and I was like holy cow like all the people she's she's you know, listed in here, the rock stars of regenerative agriculture. So it's such an honor to be, to be part of her work. And she did an absolutely phenomenal job. She did an amazing job. I thought the book was very comprehensive. I thought it really got to the point. It was easy to read and it covered it from so many different angles, which yeah. I find so interesting about your work with regenerative farming. You're working with people, but you're also helping to heal the planet. Like we said in the introduction, I think that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. And teaching people that as well, you know, passing on that message of like, you know, you're, you're helping to nourish your inner ecosystem, change your health, but at the same time, you are helping to actually heal the planet when we source our food properly. Yeah. Sourcing our food properly. I think that's such a great way to say that. And most people, I think if you were to talk about what is best for their health and the health of the planet, they would all say, you need to go plant-based. You need to be vegan. You need to be vegetarian. This is the best way to care for the planet and really improve health. And Jane's point is absolutely, that is not the case. And we really kind of judge that one wrong. What would you say about that? I mean, yeah, she's she's spot on and we need a book like this so desperately and we need more books and more movies about, you know, really, really highlighting what's wrong with the plant based movement from not even just a health standpoint, but, you know, the detrimental impacts to our environment and just that the whole narrative is so incredibly flawed and there's a lot of myths, but um, yeah, I mean, I, I I completely agree. And, you know, of course you're wearing Diana's shirt and, uh, you know, love her movie. And it's part of, you know, that homework that I give to all my clients, as far as here's the extra educational things you need to be doing outside of our session to really enforce, you know, reinforce what I'm telling you, right. That watch sacred cow, watch kiss the ground and, um, magic Hill's another good one too. And there's a little bit about regen ag in that, that movie as well, but yeah, it's just the more we get this message out, and the, and the more other people spread it and then see, you know, go to the farms and do farm tours and connect with farmers and ranchers and, and then they see the benefits for their health. It's just, it's going to continue to spread and I already see it spreading. So that's great. Yeah, yeah. no, that's great. And our last interview, I asked you specifically whether you felt optimistic or pessimistic about where we were heading. You said you felt optimistic then. Do you still feel that way? Have we made progress since we last talked? Yeah, I do. I mean, it can get so discouraging at times when you really, especially when you really talk to regenerative farmers, either those that are starting out or trying to transition right from conventional practices, it's a real struggle for them. And they're up against a lot and that can get really controversial. That's where we kind of get into the territory of um, Frederick Leroy and what he's researching, right? And 
and what he's exposing as far as the agendas, these global agendas that are um, kind of influencing, well, not kind of, they are influencing government, you know, uh, regulations that make it difficult for small farmers to really sustain themselves and to farm this way. So when you look at it from that perspective, it can get really discouraging and depressing. Like we are up against these like powerful global organizations, but there's so much we can do just through local, you know, community type, you know, outreach and awareness and education. And then again, just letting that spread and spread. And I am seeing it, you know, I'm in Maryland, right? And this is a, there was an article just a couple months ago, I think in Civil Eats, you know, this is like a hot spot for Regen Ag apparently, which I didn't even know. There's a lot of regenerative farmers out here. So, so there's people I was able to connect with and I realized, wow, like that, that filled me with hope once I saw how much is really out there and what's going on. And, and we just need to keep connecting and connecting wow. and connecting. Yeah, I love that. And I think you're right. I think it just needs to be repeated so much because we're up against those big corporations, like you said. And these corporations, their message is a little bit scary, like trying to eradicate the planet of cows or yeah. culling entire herds is like absolutely absurd, especially coming from people who say, you know, they love the planet and they love animals. It's like, that's absolutely ridiculous. It's totally ridiculous. And and their health claims are just beyond ridiculous. And uh, we had talked about this and I would still love to debate Pat Brown and <laughs> Ethan Brown, you know, the CEOs of Impossible and Beyond and, and just say, you know, and just have a conversation like, look, do you really understand the health challenges that people are up against? You know, it, it, there's autoimmunity running rampant and gut issues galore. And you know, I don't know if you saw that big study actually about um, heart disease. Apparently, only seven percent of adult Americans have good cardio metabolic health. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, that's made real big waves lately, right? So and that was in two thousand eighteen. That was data yeah, from two thousand eighteen. That's true. It's even old study, and and they looked at pretty basic stuff, really. I mean, they looked at cholesterol, which who knows what their parameters were for cholesterol, right? Was it conventional ranges or functional medicine ranges? That that could be a a debate in, in and of itself, but they looked at weight, you know, they looked at high blood pressure. Those were pretty basic markers. And if you look even deeper with like some of the functional testing that I do in my practice, we could talk about when you look even deeper and look at all these advanced inflammation markers, I mean, it's even worse, you know, it's, it's like, they're just kind of looking at surface level stuff to determine cardiometabolic health. And that alone looks really bad. So wow. then you start getting into the gut microbiome and then, like I said, inflammation and nutrient deficiencies, and it's even worse. So these foods aren't going to fix that problem. These plant-based meats are not going to fix that problem. In fact, the, the patients that come to my client, my practice that are eating those foods, they're struggling. And they're telling me sometimes I got worse eating this stuff, but I'm, I'm told I'm supposed to feel better and it's good for my health. But now I'm having all these gut issues that I didn't have before. Wow. So people aren't improving. At least I'm not actually seeing that. And, you know, I think it's only a matter of time before the whole house of cards falls apart, but uh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I sure hope so. We understand that pendulum needs to swing. It's interesting when you mention um, more advanced markers, I think a really simple one, the first thing that came to mind would just be measuring like fasting insulin, for example, yeah, like we I look totally at, we look, that. yeah, nice. So, so when yeah. we look at blood glucose, that might look normal for somebody who's highly insulin resistant for decades while the insulin is a raging fire inside their body. We're looking at the wrong thing to be able to identify problems before they occur. Bingo. And then if you put um, a CGM continuous glucose monitor on someone, whew, even more telling, I mean, what is going on with your blood sugar throughout the day? You know, how, how, what's your recovery like when you have, you know, carbohydrates and sugar, does your blood sugar stay super elevated over time? Like fasting glucose. Yeah. It's just a snapshot and tells us so very little, but yeah, looking at insulin is really, really key. And A1C of course, as well, more long-term yeah. glucose monitor. Uh, marker. Wow. So interesting. I've used the example of like getting a snapshot of the freeway at, at five o'clock and not being able to tell you whether that's 5 a.m. or 5 p.m. When you're taking those blood glucose monitors, you don't really know. That's just one snapshot in time. And you're right. Like a CGM shows you the flow and how that changes. And I've heard the craziest stories of like, I ate ice cream. It was fine. My blood sugar was fine for like two hours. It was four hours later that I noticed this crazy excursion. And so many people would not be aware of that unless they have that information. Exactly. I've had a few patients wear them. I wore one for a month as well. It was really interesting. And Diana did as well. She she had something in one of her newsletters and she was like, rice is awful for me. My blood sugar, wow. I guess, stayed pretty high 
Um, so yeah, everyone has just different physiological responses to different foods. A lot of it, of course, depends on many factors too, your stress, your nutrient deficiencies, your gut microbiome, right, your digestion. So there's things that could potentially be fixed so that that doesn't happen with these wild blood sugar swings. But yeah, that tells us so much about what's going on with cardio metabolic health. And I think it's a, too bad it's an expensive tool, but it's a fantastic tool to, to look underneath the, the surface a little more. Yeah, well, I'm glad you mentioned tools. And I just, when I think of you and I think of your work, not only do I think it's super cool that you're working with farmers, but also working individual with patients, but I also think of tools and you do not restrict yourself to any tool. You you have a vast library of things that you can use with your patients. And I love that you keep everything on the table and you highly individualize that for your patients. I think that's amazing. I definitely want to cover that um, in our discussion today, but I feel like in our last interview, we didn't get super deep into your own journey with health, which you have a pretty interesting story as far as that goes. So I would love to go a little bit deeper as far as, you, you know, what, what was your journey of health like? You grew up in Colorado, which is absolutely beautiful, but when when did you start to know that this is what you wanted to do? Oh, such a good question. Thank you. I didn't know you were going to bring this up, so I'm happy to share my story. And I feel like when we as practitioners kind of make ourselves a little vulnerable and share our stories, I realize it, it helps people connect because it's easy to see someone who looks like they're in perfect health. And what do you know about being sick or unhealthy? Right. And, um, it, it, I have so much unfortunate experience with being sick and unhealthy and chronic issues. So, um, my journey, yeah, I started in Colorado. That's where I grew up. I was, um, I have a background in ecological work, so we kind of talked a little bit about that last time, but basically conservation um, work was what I was on a tr on track to, to do. I was doing field work. I was working up in Breckenridge, Colorado, you know, in the Rocky Mountains, just absolutely beautiful. I mean, beautiful. It was so beautiful. It's, I was outside all the time and all year round. And the primary thing we were doing was looking at different um, species of wildlife. I mean, we were tracking uh, moose populations and beaver and different birds and birds especially are important indicator species for ecological health and all that. So there's like these um, beautiful little um, biodiverse hotspots that are endangered because unfortunately all the encroaching like ski resorts are affecting their habitat. So anyway, that was some of the projects I was working on loved it was very passionate about it but from a young age i always loved nutrition and health and wellness and you know would sit down and read encyclopedia of healing foods from cover to cover and just like you know it's so like so immersed in that um and i just had an epiphany one day i was um i just fell down with my biology degree so i got my undergrad in biology in denver and i just thought you know what i, I think i want to do something in the health and wellness space i felt like i just had a completely different calling and it was just, it was really hard for me to just totally switch tracks because I loved what I was doing. And I loved, I'm just a nature person and I, I wanted to be in nature. I'm like, do I want to sit down in an office all day and talk to people? Like, is that really what I want to do? And so I, I, but I felt like just really, I really listened deep within and felt, all right, I, I'm going to take a huge leap of faith. And I found, I researched schools all over the country. I fell in love with this amazing university in Maryland. It's called the Thai Sophia Institute at the time. It's Maryland University of Integrative Health. And, um, got my master's of science in nutrition and integrative health and um it was an amazing program but you know like with most degrees the real learning comes after that you know so i i got work um in a couple different settings working with different functional medicine doctors and just learned a tremendous amount and exposure to so many different cultures and different types of chronic disease uh, but the underlying thing that I, I really saw as the root cause for most people was gut issues for sure. And really start diving into the microbiome and, you know, what, what's going on there and how do we get this like inner ecosystem of ours back into balance, back into harmony to fix all these other issues. So, yeah, I mean, me personally, I struggled with, uh, pff, gosh, uh, eating disorder for 20 years. Um, it, it started out as anorexia and then more bulimia the restriction just led to lots of intense cravings. And then I would binge and then you purge. And it was just this horrible, horrible cycle. And there's all this kind of stigma around, you know, binging and, and especially purging with the bulimia. It's like, it was very shameful for me. And I hid that for so long and it was so hard to open up about it. And when I finally did actually in my grad school program, I was able to talk to people about it. Um, believe it or not, other nutritionists in my program were struggling with it as well. And we felt like this, um, like imposter syndrome, like here we are trying to help people with their health and we're like, feel like we're a mess, right? 
So it it was very cathartic to finally open up and to release that this shame and and uh, connect with other people about it. And and I found some deep healing through that and lots of therapy, you know, lots of nutritional support. And I was able to kind of help heal myself, but also had so much support from amazing practitioners. But I mean, I, I was a mess, Casey, like I, at my worst, which was actually 10 years ago, 2012, when I had moved, um, I felt like my hormones crashed. I had lost my menstrual cycle for three years. I thought I was going through early menopause. It was all the symptoms of menopause. I mean, the most horrific anxiety, you couldn't sleep no energy, um, hot flashes. Like I really thought I was dying. I thought I had Lyme disease at one point. <laughs> it was really, really bad. I mean, then the anxiety just made me pretty just, dis- you know, dysfunctional. I couldn't get out of bed some days because it was so debilitating um, and just physically felt unwell. My gut was a mess. Oh my God. Like my digestion was a mess from a young age. I was raised on a standard American diet and, you know, it was just a horrible foundation I was given. And, uh, yeah, so it just compounded over time and, but I, I reached the state of healing and I've, I can say I've been fully recovered from any sort of binge purge episode for at least four years now. So wow. four years, and that was a big deal, you know, to not have like, to be able to eat sugar and not binge is so amazing for me. Like it's, wow. it makes, it actually makes me want to cry, which sounds silly, but it's like, so, so many people are struggling with sugar addiction and it's not getting acknowledged by the medical community. Oh, food, ex- you know, food addictions don't exist. That's not real. Oh, they absolutely exist. And there's a lot of people dealing with this sugar addiction and carb addiction thing. And, but now I can eat those things without restricting them and not wanting to have any temptation to binge. So I feel like I've really fixed whatever was out of whack in my physiology and mentally wow. emotionally as well. So wow. I, yeah. That's the whole crazy journey. <laughs> that's incredible. Thank you for sharing that. And thank you for being so vulnerable about that. I really appreciate that. Um when was it do you do you feel like it was the therapy that really helped you the most and and sharing feelings and understanding that other people were going through the same thing that you were? That's a good question. And I get that all the time. Like, what was it the most? Was it the therapy? And I, it's so hard for me to, to say, because there's so many things I was doing at the time, like so many different modalities, was getting acupuncture and definitely therapy and connecting with other people that were suffering from, you know, eating disorders as well. And I had done a lot of that work even prior to like my really bad crash. So I, you know, definitely wasn't the therapy alone, but I will say one of the biggest game changers for me was doing micronutrient testing to figure out my deficiencies. I had a severe deficiency in zinc. Um, And in the literature, we actually can see that zinc deficiencies are pretty common. They run pretty common for bulimics Um, and all sorts of mental health issues, right? Because zinc is critical for neurotransmitter production, like serotonin and um, copper is needed for dopamine. And so minerals are very, very important. And we could talk about all the amazing animal sources where we get those, right? But like incorporating um, supplementation into my diet was very important because I used to be like a food only kind of practitioner where I was sort of not anti-supplements, but I just was like, we can get everything through food. Like we really don't need supplements if you source it right. And, you know, that was sort of how I approached nutrition at first. But when I really utilized supplements with myself and clients, I got amazing results. So I'm a huge fan of supplements, but obviously it has to be in combination with you know, a healing, nourishing diet. But yeah, like the nutrition was one of the big game changers. I think when I really got to the root of my nutritional deficiencies and healing my gut, I mean, I, I felt like that was really instrumental in my recovery. Wow. That's amazing. But tell us a little bit about your health education that you were receiving in school. Like what were they teaching you? Was it more like plant-based kind of diet that, you know, like I learned with my nutrition certification or what were they telling you? Yeah, I intentionally avoided programs like that. And that's also why I didn't go the route of being a registered dietitian, because unfortunately, uh, well, you know, a lot of people don't know this, but the Registered Dietitians Association is actually funded by a lot of big food corporations. Um, right. Kellogg's and Pepsi Cola uh, used to be funders, maybe still are. Bayer, aka Mazzano, is still a big funder. Uh, so anyway, I potentially didn't go that route of going to a university that was teaching nutrition from that sort of perspective. I was already kind of into paleo and that sort of thing. So I knew, you know, food pyramid was all screwed up and I didn't want to learn that. So I found a school that was teaching nutrition from a more integrative holistic perspective, which is the Maryland University of Integrated Health. I mentioned they, um, you know, they were incredible as far as giving us a very well-rounded education. No education is perfect. I mean, there was still a lot missing from the curriculum as far as like, you know, there's nothing on region ag, of course, and where food comes from. And to me, that is a foundational class that needs to be in every single freaking university. 
even if it's not a nutrition program, like everyone needs to learn where does your food come from, right? But especially a nutrition program or any health practitioner, right, needs to know that. So we didn't learn anything about that, which is not surprising, but I think that could change. And um, yeah, it was just a lot of biochemistry, definitely a lot of physiology, um, you know, pathophysiology, so learning about different diseases. And um, a lot of the, the program was set up to give you prereqs to go on to become a naturopath, naturopathic doctor, um, which I didn't want to do because I was just exhausted with school at that point. But um, yeah, but, but a set me up for like, you know, having that foundation that a lot of naturopaths kind of have as far as like really understanding, you know, human anatomy and physiology and, and disease processes in the body. Yeah, so. so interesting. I agree with you 100% about the regenerative education, education as far as like the class goes, yeah. like how, how we can divorce all of these things and have them all be in like different silos. It's like, it's almost weird to talk about nutrition without talking about like cooking skills. Like most kids don't even know how to like dice an onion or really simple things in the kitchen. Yeah, we had class and that's part of why I chose the schools because they did have and I'm not trying to sit here and plug them, but I do think they're a phenomenal school because they do incorporate um, whole food cooking classes in every single trimester. So I learned how to cook organ meats. I learned how to first class 101, how, how to cut an onion. Like, oh, I didn't know how to cut an onion that way. That's really cool and clever. Like how to take care of your, your, your knife and your, your kitchenware and gadgets and just like really basic stuff like that. But then also really advanced how to make ferments, how to make a variety of ferments, um, how to make bone broth. You know, we, we had so many cool cooking classes and that was just like one of the major highlights it was, it was awesome. So jealous. So jealous. That sounds amazing. <laughs> it was an expensive program though. Don't get me wrong. It was masters, but no, there's all these other programs out there and I'm not sure which one you did, but I looked at them and yeah, they were either teaching from like plant-based perspective or just not really diving deep into to science. And, and um, I will say the program was lacking functional testing. Most of that all came after grad school as well. I had to learn that on my own through lots and lots of training and with all the labs and different doctors and practitioners. And so, yeah, that's missing from a lot of curriculums too, sadly. Interesting. Wow. Well, yeah. you talked about gut health and it's something that we talk about a lot without really ever doing like a really good deep dive into it. So I'm excited to talk about that today. When you say your gut health was totally wrecked, was it mostly diet? Was it mostly that standard American diet that you were brought up on that did it? Did you do antibiotics a bunch as a kid? Like what contributed to your poor gut health? Good question. So when you, if like, if when I first meet with every client, like in my intake form, I want to know their foundation from like the very beginning, like, were you breastfed, right? Were you born vaginally or C-section that lays down the foundation for your microbiome. So I, I wasn't C-section baby, but I wasn't breastfed, um, standard American diet, right. Total processed food. Um, you know, my mom would do some home cooked meals and we had a garden, you know, a few years, but it was definitely a lot of stuff out of boxes and packages. And I was super, super sugar addicted, like pouring tons of sugar on my already sugary cereal bad, so bad. But yeah, that I think right there, just the sugar, there was probably lots of like yeast, like fungal overgrowth, um, that was going on. That's very common for so many people. Um, and just, uh, just a totally dysbiotic environment, right? A lot of dysbiosis, a lot of imbalances with the good and bad bacteria because of that. Add to that the, you know, childhood traumas that I experienced. And so the stress and anxiety, right? That can also impact the gut. Toxin exposure. I didn't, I don't recall having a lot of antibiotics. Um, you know, kind of had the normal vaccine schedule for most children. And we do know that there's, you know, some detrimental impacts, unfortunately, with sure. vaccines in the microbiome. So, um, you know, not a lot of antibiotics. It was just mostly, I think, largely stress and just really crappy diet for me. Interesting. And when I, is your story very consistent with a lot of the people that you work with? Do most people have those same things? Like, what are some of the common ailments you see in the gut? Oh man, good question. I mean, no, it's, it's like all over the place and I work with all ages. I mean, kids, you know, older, elderly adults and everything in between. And, um, yeah, it's just, everybody has such 
different, different backgrounds. And especially when I was working in the DC area, we talked about this before where it was like a big melting pot. Right. And that was my first time being in like a big city with that many diverse cultures because Denver's not that diverse as DC area. And I would work with people from all over the world. And that's when I was hearing from people like, Oh my God, your food doesn't have any flavor in this country. Like what's wrong with the food. Um, and it seemed like they actually had much healthier upbringings than we did in the United States. Right. Especially if you're a child of like the eighties and nineties, like we were pretty much given that crappy standard American diet growing up, you know, raised on margarine and cereal and all that. Right. Processed foods galore. So, yeah, I mean, the, the common theme is that most people I would say have an imbalance in their microbiome and we could totally dive a little deeper into that like what is this inner ecosystem all about what all is in a microbiome and what's a healthy microbiome look like but i will have people that come to my practice that want to lose weight or they want to resolve their autoimmune disorder or they want to fix their cognitive issues or you know their their mood disorders their depression their anxiety and one of the first questions i ask them is have you ever or has anyone walked you through any of the practitioners you worked with? Has anyone walked you through a comprehensive, like three to six month minimum intensive gut healing protocol or digestive support protocol? And pretty much 100% of the time, the answer is no. I've never had anyone answer yes to that. It's either no or it's, oh, well, yeah, we did a stool test one time and I did some probiotics and some glutamine powder and, you know, and I drank bone broth, you know, dabbled in some things, right? And they either did it themselves or the practitioner was like, you know, did the testing, here's some supplements, see you in a couple months sort of thing. Not very guided, not intensive, not high touch, meaning we're like contacting each other all the time and meeting every couple weeks or so, you know, through Zoom. And messaging, you know, staying in touch and keeping me updated on their symptoms. How's it going with this? How's it going with that? That is an intensive protocol. And that's what I do in my practice. And that is where I start with just about everyone, even the people that are coming in for a different reason that don't necessarily have a gut issue per se. I learned recently that about 15% of people with celiac disease, for example, have zero gut issues. I actually have a practitioner friend who has three daughters with celiac. And only one of them was not symptomatic. And for the longest time, they had no idea that she was, you know, gluten sensitive, like extreme gluten sensitive, right? Celiac. Um, until they tested her because she was having other issues. She was having cognitive issues and joint problems, but no gut issues to speak of. So it's, it's a little bit more challenging with patients like that, right? To correlate some of their symptoms with the gut. It's like, well, my stomach's fine. I have good bowel movements. I don't have gas and I'm bloating. I don't have all those issues, but they're having other symptoms that are definitely connected to the gut. Wow. That makes it so difficult, I think, for most people to identify because you're right. You would think, I, I wouldn't really consider that I was having gut issues if my problems were neuro neurological the way you're describing. So I think that's a really, really good point. Wow. So what are some of the steps as you're trying to help somebody recover? What are some of the steps you take people through as far as this goes? Ah, oh, such a good question. So, and this is a program that spans typically over six months. Cause I tell people, you know, this is like a transformation, right? Like this isn't just, you're coming in to make a couple symptoms go away. You really want to transform your, your health and totally nourish this inner ecosystem and bring it back into this harmony and balance to see these things just not only go away, these symptoms go away, but stay away for good. Right. And it, that doesn't happen overnight. You know, I've, I've heard some practitioners say, you know, the, the gut lining can heal in 21 days, right? You may have heard that before. It doesn't take long to heal leaky gut. You can just take some glutamine and drink bone broth. And that might be true, but that's only one aspect of gut healing. There's many, many layers. So it starts, you know, I take them through this journey and start with what's going on in the head, right? We work on stress. We work on supporting the vagus nerve. And I'm sure you've heard of the vagus nerve, right? And activating the parasympathetic system, which is your rest and relaxation system. Most of us are in fight or flight, especially like post pandemic and all that. Um, a lot of people are just in the sympathetic fight or flight overdrive. That makes it really hard for the gut to heal. So we start there. And, you know, talk about like digestion starts in the head and like chewing your food well. It's critical to get your enzymes going, right? And get your, your, your gastric juices flowing to help you break down your food properly. Um, we definitely start with functional testing. So I do stool testing and organic acid testing, among some other tests. But we want to look at what is currently happening in your gut. And especially for people that don't have issues, like, well, let's just still look. Like, you don't have the gut issues, but I still want to see what's going on with the diversity in your gut microbiome. Um, and I want to see, there's a lot we can see with upper digestion as far as enzymes, like I mentioned, um, stomach acid, 
short chain fatty acid production, um, bile flow, you know, do you have good bile flow? Are you breaking down your fats? Well, we can see all that in a functional stool test and no test is perfect. I always put that caveat out there. It's still just kind of like a snapshot in time. So we do have to take it with like a grain of salt. Um, you know, if I could do a stool test every single day on, on someone for like a month, we could get like amazing data to really see what's going on with your gut. But you know, there the functional testing is pricey. So we do this one, one test and we get at least some data and that's where, you know, we go through step-by-step step this journey. Let's optimize upper digestion, right? There's, there's ways we can do bitters and, um, you know, I have this digestive tonic drink that I give my clients and it's a recipe that they make at home with like it's water, it's apple cider vinegar, raw honey, fresh squeezed lemon juice and grated ginger. So everybody that's listening, you can just make that yourself. And it's this wonderful wow. tonic that helps support upper digestion. Um, but that's really like, once you work on everything upstream, right, it can help so much with everything downstream, but we start there working on upper GI support. And there's other ways we support all those different organ systems that I mentioned too, with the stomach, pancreas, gallbladder, liver. Um, and, but then we, we look at what's going on lower, you know, the lower, um, digestion with the small intestine and the bowel. And I want to look at the diversity. Are you really, really lacking a lot of key beneficials, you know, these, these keystone species, um, that really help enhance, you know, our, our health, that help us break down oxalates, um, that help us break, you know, keep our inflammation low, that optimize our immune system, and also help to keep pathogens at bay. You know, all of us are carrying quote unquote pathogens to some degree and parasites. So the goal isn't to get rid of every single parasite or pathogen in your body, just like in a regenerative system, you know, and in, on a farm, right? We don't want to get rid of every weed. And really what's a weed, you know, a weed is usually an ecological indicator of something that's just out of balance with your soil. And sometimes that weed is nourishment for something else. Right. Um, so we, we, I try to get people to also look at that too, that in a different perspective, that these pathogens, it might show up in a test are telling us something's really out of balance. And it's usually lacking that diversity. I mean, Casey, what's the thing you hear about all the time in regenerative agriculture? What's what's the sign of a healthy pasture? Diversify, diversify, diversify. Bingo. Like if you, you having so many different species of plants really helps to make that soil microbiome incredibly resilient. And it's the same thing for our gut. Same thing for our microbiome. If your inner ecosystem is very diverse, then you have a more resilient microbiome that can tolerate, you know, some of these pathogens. If we look at the like the Hadzas, right? You sure you've seen a lot of research on their microbiome. Yeah. Um, and I've used that in some of my presentations. It's really fascinating. When we look at their microbiome, sometimes they are carrying a huge pathogen load and they don't exhibit all the gut issues and health issues that we do, right? So what is, what's the difference? The difference is when you look at all the amazing other species that they have, tremendous amount of diversity compared to our microbiomes in the Western world, where we've just decimated so many things. And, you know, it's just like a corn or soy field, right? That's just wiped out all the beneficial species. And now you got weeds running over the place and you got to use antibiotics or, you know, uh, pesticides, right. To control them. So there's so many analogies that we can make between what we're doing in our agricultural systems and what's happening with our, with our gut microbiome. But back to that whole journey, it's just like, we, we do everything we can to optimize that microbiome. We use a ton of different probiotics. Um, I I've heard some practitioners say like, don't use probiotics. You're, you're, um, monocropping your, <laughs> your gut microbiome by doing that. But that's why you, you switch it up and you use different things. Um, and fermented foods, of course, are incredible, you know, absolutely a critical part of that healing process. It's all about that synergy of, of, of what the foods offer and the supplements at the same time. That's where I really see the magic happening. Um, so we do all that. There's, you know, like it's quite a process, right? And behind the scenes underlying all that, we're looking at detoxification, um, stress, like I mentioned, right? quality water. Are you drinking enough? Are you drinking good quality water? So key and so, so missed quite often. Um, what's going on with your thyroid? What's going on with your adrenals? You know, what's going on with your liver? Are you, know, are you really detoxing well? How do your, how does your mitochondrial function look? And a lot of this is, it shows up on the testing and it's amazing because we can test and then retest and see at the end of this protocol, I usually test halfway through. And then at the end, how things have changed and it's amazing like the results and of course people feel incredible and wow. it's 
it's it's a process though. <laughs> wow. It's so interesting that you mentioned fermented foods. And as you were describing our gut environment, that's the first thing that I was thinking of is, you know, if I'm brewing a batch of beer or I'm doing a batch of kimchi or something, you're 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 not making the beer. You're creating a recipe for yeast to go to work and the yeast is actually making the beer. Same with sauerkraut. You're just setting up conditions for different bacteria to eat one another until you get the right flavor that you need. And so it sounds like if that's almost exactly the same situation with our human guts, and it doesn't really surprise me that those are the healthiest foods to feed the guts. Yeah. I often tell people the colon is just a giant fermentation factory. You know, that's where most of, that's where most of our microbiome is, but we have a microbiome everywhere. Right. And that's the other part I didn't mention too, is that not only are we just working on kind of internal microbiomes, external microbiomes are just as critical to pay attention to what is going on with your skin? What, what kind of body care products are you using, right? Are they toxic? Are they clean? Um, there's all these really cool probiotic sprays that you can put on your skin as well. Um, you know, what about the nasal microbiome, you know, or the vaginal microbiome, right? There's so many different microbiomes, the respiratory microbiome throughout and on the entire body that we also have to nourish and take care of and get back into balance. But a lot, usually when people say the word microbiome, they're kind of referring to the gut specifically, but it's not exclusively the gut, right? We have, we have these critters everywhere on us and we want, we want yeah. the good ones. <laughs> wow. No, that's a really, really good point. So what, after, after you kind of have an idea of, of where to kind of like attack with people, what generally has to happen with their nutrition to support better gut health? Oh, good question. Yeah, of course. I got to talk about that. That's the foundation, right? So that is, in addition to talking about usually stress and what's going on, you know, in our, in our minds and emotionally and psychologically, the, the first session is always about food quality. So usually in that very initial session, it's how to start sourcing your food from the best farmers, you know, how to get to know your farmers, finding farmers markets in their area, that kind of thing, and, and helping them decipher labels in the store, you know, and, and, you know, we, we talked a little bit about this before too, like cage free and re free range don't mean diddly squat. So it's, it's really getting to know your farmer and knowing what they're feeding their animals, um, giving them that education, making sure, you know, wash, wash, kiss the ground and sacred cow and really understand the nourishment that you need to support you like for that foundational support. Um, because that's huge, right? The, the big thing that's knocking out a lot of our beneficial microbes, I feel is the toxins. Yes. The antibiotics for sure. But like I said, there's people like me that I didn't grow up with a lot of antibiotics. My gut was total mess. Um, it was, it was most definitely, I think more the, the toxins in our food than anything else. And in addition to lacking all the, you know, the vital nutrients that we need from nutrient dense food, but those toxins, those, those pesticide chemicals are hardcore. I mean, they will take out a lot of our beneficial microbes. Wow. Wow. So I'm wondering, how do you see the utility of something like a carnivore diet, at least as a short term tool to help kind of reset for somebody? Because when I hear toxins and pesticides, my mind goes to like, oh, maybe you should have a super high amount of plant material in the gut. How do you how do you see that? Oh, okay. God, it's such a good question. So yeah. Okay. Carnivore. Um, I'm a big fan of carnivore. In fact, I eat more carnivore or like pretty much mostly carnivore in the winter. So I'm a really big fan of seasonal eating depending on where you live. Right. So I'm again, the Northeast uh, part of the country where we have four, four distinct seasons and I have a garden. And so once the garden kind of dies out and the farmer's markets aren't around, you know, I don't really want to eat stuff out of a greenhouse. I'm trying to mimic nature and I go pretty much carnivore. Um, and therapeutically it is is an amazing tool to, to help people. And, but what I've been finding, um, is that people will, I have had actually Sean Baker had me on his show and I got a few people that reached out, um, saying, you know, I love carnivore. It's changed my life and I feel so freaking good, but I don't want to eat this way forever. Like I miss having an avocado and I miss, you know, I miss all these other foods. I don't want to be on like this restrictive diet. You know, Sean Baker's happy as a clam doing what he's doing. That's great. Like he's rocking it and that's fabulous, but some people don't want to live this lifestyle long-term. And so it's like, let's figure out what's wrong then. Let's try to actually figure out what, let's go through this process of three to six month long journey and see what we can do to get this ecosystem back into balance. So you can tolerate foods again. And usually people can, they can tolerate certain foods slowly over time. It just, everybody's different. It's so hard to put a timeline on it. For some people, it might take them a year or more. Um, for someone like Michaela Peterson, you know, you know, her story, do you know, Michaela? Yeah. yeah, it's, it's mind blowing, right. Um, how very, very sick she was. And I recall her saying at the end of one of her presentations, like, look, I'd like to eat more than just beef and water and salt. <laughs> and I think she's kind of dived now into a little bit more like lamb and stuff like that. But, um, 
she's like, I, I just, I can't like my body just reacts so severely to other things. And I would love to know, like, what has she done for gut healing protocol? Like I, I, these, so for folks that just really don't want to be on this restrictive diet, like my goal is to help open up and diversify their diet. Cause I personally want the most diverse diet I can. I eat so many different things and summer is just like phenomenal, right? It's like the seafood and the meats and, but it's, it's just, I, I don't know. I, I feel like it has to be used as a tool and I have concerns about the, the long-term impacts of it. I have had people, um, I've had just a small handful of carnivore people and I, I would love to talk to um, Sean Baker about this and his patients, but as far as like my small handful of uh, carnivore patients that have done stool testing, their microbiome looks awful. It doesn't look good as far as diversity. Really? Wow. Yes. And it looks just as bad as, as everyone else that's struggling with gut issues. So I'm like, okay, you know, got to take it with a grain of salt because there's a lot we don't understand about the microbiome still. And if you um, have looked at the research of like Lucy Mailings, you know, PhD researcher who's doing phenomenal work as far as like, you know, um, kind of exposing the myth of fiber, right? Like fiber isn't the most essential thing we need to help enhance the microbiome, but for some people it really is. It makes a huge difference for some people. For some people, it's awful for them, right? Their bloating gets worse, their symptoms get worse. So again, what's the imbalance that's maybe creating that? Um, I've heard that, uh, and I think Lucy Mailings has talked about this in her research that, um, and other folks, that you don't really need the prebiotic fibers to create those short chain fatty acids, right? To nourish your gut lining. Well, patients I've had on these carnivore diets, they don't have very robust short chain fatty acid levels. Now that's in the stool, right? So I'm just like, you know, kind of like, okay, how does that reflect maybe what's in the bloodstream? I don't really know, but I'm not, if, if, if in theory, these ketones are being converted over into, you know, the, the short chain butyric acid, the short chain fatty acid, butyric acid, I, I would think I see at least somewhat decent levels on a stool test, but they're very critically low. And so I just, you know, in my head, I always stay open and I always question myself because that's what any good scientist or researcher does is you always question yourself and, and, and question the science and say, okay, well, what does this actually mean? Is this a bad thing? Is this just mean their gut has adopted to maybe lower levels of, you know, needing to short chain fatty acids? I don't know, but they have very low levels often. And I find that gradually adding in just a little bit of some prebiotic fibers, just, it seems to help, but you have to just figure out what that imbalance is first. Do they have yeast overgrowth? Do they have parasites that are causing this inflammation and damage in the gut? Um, bacterial overgrowth, you know, bad bacteria, uh, especially gram negative bacteria that release these lipopolysaccharide, you know, toxins. And, you know, it's just, there's so much complexity to the microbiome to, to resolve that first and then slowly introduce other foods is, is kind of the process that you, that, that, that I do in my practice anyways. Wow. So, no, that's yeah. so fascinating. And, and those are the stories that you hear, like in the carnivore world, you hear all the time that you don't need, you know, you don't need fiber because your body can make it out of ketones. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned the butyric acid. And, and with, I've, I've heard many people in the carnivore world say that, yes, we might not have a very diverse gut microbiome, but we're only eating the same, like two or three things most of the time. So does it really matter? It's just so interesting to hear that there's so much more nuance there than somebody like me, a carnivore would appreciate. I want simple answers. I want to just tell people to be Sean Baker and eat steak. And I always have to check myself and remember that there's, there's so much more to the picture than, than just eat this one thing and that's it. Yeah, I, absolutely. I, I really question that claim about the diversity piece because I have an awesome actually graphic on that somewhere about um, the strong correlations between greater diversity in the, the human microbiome and, and correlate how that correlates to better health outcomes, you know, whether it's healthier blood pressure, or cardiometabolic health or weight, there's a clear correlation. So I do get concerned about like long-term, you know, carnivore diets and what impact that's really going to have. And I, I, like I said, I'd love to connect with Sean and be like, Hey, are you looking at like soul testing and, and just out of curiosity, I'd like to see what that data looks like for those people. Um, because I, I, I do have some concerns and then there's, of course, there's the exceptions and sometimes they're rare that we have to think about. Um, I know you and Jane in your interview had talked about, um, Jane Buxton had talked about like, there's so many iron deficiencies, right? And, but then you can have the, the opposite of that in which people are in iron overload and it doesn't even mm -hmm. have to be hemochromatosis. Okay. That's a, a more kind of rare genetic disorder where your body can't regulate iron properly. Um, but I have seen other people that are sometimes just carriers for that gene um, 
and they can still exhibit some of those hemochromatosis sort of traits where their iron levels are incredibly high. You have to look at ferritin, which is a storage form of iron. And those are people that are in iron overload. And um, Dr. Mercola, he really, really has a lot of, had a lot of great articles in his library about this, but um, so do other practitioners talk about this iron overload issue. It, iron, it, it creates a lot of oxidative stress in the body. It's kind of like rusting the body. You don't want too much iron. Carnivore is a recipe for disaster for people like that, right? I mean, they're just going to go way into iron overload. So there's just certain things, right? Like this is why everybody is needs to be treated as an individual and we can't just use like these one size fit all approach. And not that anyone, in, you know, even in the carnivore community is doing that. I mean, Sean is always very open-minded and, you know, do what works for you. And this works yeah. for me. And I love that about him. Um, so, you know, not, but, you know, just making sure all of us, all of us, including myself are mindful about not pushing any kind of, um, you know, template or basic recommendation for people until we know what's going on with their physiology. Right? Sure. Do testing. Yeah, no, that's such a good point. I really love that type of nuance. You already mentioned kind of like reintroducing plant foods and maybe both for somebody who is carnivore though does want to reintroduce plant foods or maybe just somebody that doesn't necessarily want to go carnivore. They, they don't want to eliminate all plants, totally fine. Like right. what are some of the safest plants that you like to see included in people's diets? Again, understanding the nuance that everybody is a little bit different, but there, there must be some patterns that you see with, with safer foods than other foods that might be a little bit more questionable. Yeah, I mean, I think, well, I think a little bit of fruit is fine for most people unless they're kind of already um, in total yeast overload, you know, then sugars can be really difficult. Um, or if they have metabolic issues like diabetes and that kind of thing, and I'm trying to keep their sugars and carbs like intentionally on the lower side. Um, I mean, I think avocados are wonderful for most people. It's one of those times I break my rule of going local and seasonal because <laughs> obviously there's no avocados around here, but you know, <laughs> I, I love avocados. I think most people can um, tolerate them, you know, if they're not having gallbladder issues and that kind of thing. But even then it's, you know, it's kind of one of those type of fats that doesn't require a ton of a bile um, for breakdown and absorption. But I, I think some leafy greens are okay and generally cooked. Like when we cook the vegetables for people with impaired digestion, that seems to make a difference. So um, not spinach. <laughs> spinach, as you probably know, is crazy high in oxalates. Crazy and, high. Yeah. Organic acid testing. I see so many people high in oxalates, like super wow. high. Wow. Yeah. And they don't have to be pounding green smoothies every day or eating like big spinach salads. And they're already um, in oxalate overload. And that's because fungal species in the body also produce oxalates. And then when you lack certain beneficial flora in the gut, um, bifidobacterium lactis specifically and, um, and acidophilus, I think uh, a lactobacillus species, I'm trying to remember which one specifically, but those ones are oxalate degraders um, that help to break down those oxalates too. So, you know, those, I, I feel like though, in general, those types of, um, you know, cooked vegetables, even some root vegetables, again, it's hard to say there's caveats to everything because <laughs> even with like certain tubers, right? If they're too starchy, if there's yeast, if there's, you know, that kind of, or just like SIBO, you know, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, they can really struggle with those types of foods. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it still kind of depends on the person, but yeah, those are like, you know, cooked veggies in the form of like soups and stuff like that seem to be, you know, just gently easing into them seems yeah. to be the general, I guess, trend that I see. Nice. Yeah. yeah, I really love the advice that comes from Dr. Bill Schindler. He wrote the book, Eat Like a Human. Yes. And he says in his first chapter, like plants should scare the hell out of you. And it's not to say don't eat plants. It's to be mindful and be really respectful that these things are really smart. They have chemicals that need to be dealt with. And we need to not just think that we're so entitled that we can just eat whatever fruits and vegetables year round, not seasonally all the time without dealing with some of those things, without fermenting and sprouting and, and cooking and preparing foods that's what makes us human and so i love that you say that just just cook your vegetables that's a great way to make them safer and easier to access the nutrients yeah he's so awesome he's here in maryland actually too and yeah, that's that. right. he, he held um he might be doing another one of these it was like i can't remember what the event was called but kind of like they took you through the journey of human history like all the different things we ate and you know we started with crickets a meal with crickets it was an awesome event so so cool yeah he really opened my eyes to a lot of things too just like all right here's a guy that's definitely into this more like primal movement but he's doing sourdough bread and and it's kind of i mean it's you know to me it was reminiscent of uh Weston A. Price, you know, where they're not like yeah. anti-grain and anti-dairy and all that. It's just how you prepare and process them. 
So that can make a critical difference too. So yeah. And I mean, and I, I would say great uh, plant foods too, just even thinking about grains, like that's kind of the huge, like thing I cut out for most people with gut issues, just because of the phytates and the, you know, the, the concerns with lectins and all that. Um, and just how they're grown. Right. I mean, if the people aren't like totally organic at this point and not that organic's perfect, but we do know there's a, a you know, lower pesticide load when you do organic foods, when you eat organic foods. Um, but those seem to be the most problematic for people is definitely grains. So I kind of yeah. use paleo as a bit of a template, um, but of the plant foods. Yeah. That's one for sure. That's I definitely see causes the most issues for people. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Well, this is just pure speculation. I just want to get your hunch. What, what your opinion is. We've now been able to interview Sally Norton twice on the show. So talking about oxalates, we've also hosted uh, Monique Attinger. She's known as the low ox coach. And they're telling you about all the different signs and symptoms of oxalate poisoning. And it's, it's insane. It's crazy. And I, I think, I think to myself, like this is either complete nonsense or this is so pervasive and and so many people have issues with oxalates what where do you lean on that do you think do you think most people like a great majority of people have a huge issue with oxalates um i i based on what i've seen in my practice through like gosh how many hundreds of oats oat tests i've seen oat is organic acid testing um I, I definitely think there's a huge problem with oxalates. So my first thing is like, just test and retest. Like, let's really see if your oxalates are that high. Um, and I, I think it goes back to the microbiome more than anything. Cause like I said, you're getting this oxalate um, excretion from the yeast and mold. Okay. So fungal species create oxalates in the body. And so we're already dealing with oxalate overload because of our screwed up microbiome. And then on top of that, our body can't handle the oxalates from our food. So yeah, I do. I, I, you know, I've seen those sites where oxalate, okay, what's oxalate with symptoms of oxalate overload? It overlaps with so many things, right? I mean, um, we can get into stuff like around histamine issues and salicylates. And it's like, how, how much are we going to like, you know, restrict our diet and minimize our diets where you're just eating you know, beef and water <laughs> and, right. and salt, right? Like right. there's so many things we could cut out and be reactive to, but I think food sensitivity testing is helpful to a degree too, just to figure out like what foods are provoking an immune system response. That's another way to kind of like fine tune the diet. And that, that gets controversial because there's some tests that are really not good quality. Uh, food sensitivity tests and some I think are definitely much more accurate and better than others. But um, yeah, I mean, I, it's, I do think there's a big oxalate issue, but I think people are missing the point that it, it goes back to the gut. They're just like diet, 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 diet for the most part. Right. I don't know. I don't see a lot of people saying like, oh yeah, this is because of, um, fungal issues in the gut. And I, I really learned that from, uh, Grace Liu at the gut Institute. I've done a lot of training with her and she's, you know, she's incredible. She's, she really has presented a lot of that research on oxalate excretion from fungal species. Did you, did you know that, that that's no. part yeah, so most a lot of people don't really um, are aware of that. So it's important to understand that a lot of this oxalate issues is coming from the excretion of those fungal species and missing those beneficial bacteria that can break down um, break down those oxalates. There, there's a um, a specific species called Oxalobacter fermenges, and that got a lot of attention in the functional medicine community. Like, oh, this species of probiotic breaks down these oxalates in the gut, and then it turns out we're all freaking missing it on a, a certain stool test that was very popular at one point. Like oh, we don't have this species. So, you know, we just have to not eat oxalates. And well, no, it turns out those other, the bifidobacterium and lactobacillus species I mentioned, those are big time oxalate degraders and we can get those supplementally and through fermented foods. So. Yeah. It's yeah. such a cool way to look at that. I really appreciate your perspective as, as we're improving the gut, as we're healing the gut, it occurs to me that we can absorb our nutrients much better and get those things that we need. Maybe this is a good time to show some of those slides um, that you and I uh, we're kind of talking about offline. I think they were super interesting. Can you maybe pull those up and kind of yeah, explain what you have? Totally. Let's see what would um, make sense right now. We're on the topic of digestion. So I want to pull this one up first. Um, so when we talk about like the nutrients that um, the gut needs, can you see that? Nutrients yep. needed for digestive support. Yep. So yep. yeah, I mean, this is this is the, a chart that I put together primarily based on Chris Masterjohn's incredible research. He has a really cool course. He's a PhD nutrition researcher. Um, he has a great course, Vitamins and Minerals Guide 101. Um, and I pulled some information from a few other sources as well. But 
he has compiled amazing research on like all sorts of individual vitamins and minerals and um, talked about their function and, you know, the top food sources. And so, you know, when it comes to gut healing, I, I put this together specifically for my talks on digestive healing. And these are all the key nutrients. And the ones I circled in red are the ones I especially feel are critically important for a lot of people and that I see come up deficient quite often in micronutrient testing that I do. So what's very interesting about this chart, right? And this is where, you know, those of us that are in favor of eating animal foods, look at the commonality between all the food sources. Like it's just, and I intentionally capitalize liver so that, you know, to emphasize the point, yes, organ meats are so nutrient dense. Um, you know, it, it's just a common theme, right? And these are in order um, of top top to, you know, most to least as far as the amount of each nutrient they contain. So for example, pork has way more B1 than nutritional yeast. Um, but, you know, the top of the list is often organ meats. Um, in the case of B5, nutritional yeast is very important. Um, but, you know, for people with yeast issues, you can't add in nutritional yeast. You'd obviously want to eat more of um, liver. I personally don't eat a lot of nutritional yeast. Um, but, that's, you know, it's, you see the common themes here. One thing I did mention about B6 that I should have put in this chart, um, B6 is a critical nutrient for oxalate breakdown as well. So sometimes it's nutritional deficiencies too that are causing oxalate problems for people. Um, B6 is a big one. It's need in, needed in that metabolic pathway to actually break down oxalates, um, which I don't think we actually do in our body. I think that's just, you know, the microbes that do that. But um, yeah, I mean, look, there's just animals, animals, animal meats, you know, Glutamine, of course, so crucial. And this is an amino acid that helps to pretty much nourish. It's the fuel source of the small intestinal cells, the enterocytes, uh, that we need to heal that gut lining. You know, I have another really cool diagram on, on leaky gut um, where I really pop that up and show people about, you know, like what's going on in the gut, like at the microscopic layer. So I'd be happy to show that one too. Um, but yeah, I mean, the exceptions are, you know, you can see the two exceptions, right? Where they're not, it's not a significant amount of um, animal foods. Oops, I think I bounced out of that one. Let me go back there. There we go. Um, can you see it, the chart? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So there's a couple exceptions, right? I mean, magnesium and vitamin C and potassium. Um, yeah, there's some animal foods where we can get these from, but that's where I just, I wonder too about the long-term implications of, you know, a, a carnivore diet as far as how that's impacting our nutrient status. Like I would love to see micronutrient tests for people that have been on this, this kind of diet long-term and look at your vitamin C status and your magnesium and potassium. Um, if you're having to supplement with a lot of those, it's like, all right, you know, something's missing in the diet, right? Yeah, sure. So yes, I mean, I, I that's, that's something I, I thought was pretty interesting. So I don't know if you had any yeah, no, I, I love that. Now, when we're talking about organ meats and liver in particular, there seems to be a really nice balance that we should be getting. It seems like there's a lot of people that went, you know, head first into like tons of organ supplements, especially mm -hmm. liver, and are now developing issues where they have to do other things that they weren't doing before to kind of deal with the, the issues, especially it seems around like vitamin A. So yeah. what what kind of proportion should people be thinking of if they want to introduce organ meats? Is it, I, I, Obviously, it's going to be highly variable between people, but are there some like yeah. guidelines that people can keep in mind? Yeah, I mean, I just try to like, for me, when with questions like that, I just try to go back to like, what would we have eaten in Paleolithic times? Uh, but then also remember we're in modern times. We probably need greater amounts of certain nutrients with all that we're you know, dealing with in our modern world, right? But how often would we have eaten like organ meats? Like, and, and you know, one animal, you know, like you kill bison or whatever, and it's, it has one liver. It's pretty darn big liver, but, you know, that can nourish people for um, quite a bit of time. But I mean, me personally, I probably eat like a pound of chicken livers every week. I usually make pate or some other recipe. Um, and I will also maybe incorporate in some ground, um, you know, ground organ meats with, with my beef, you know, or bison. Um, so I like those blends, you know, those ground organ meat blends with the ground meat, um, do a little bit of that each week. And, you know, and I just, I test my micronutrient status every year just to stay on top of it and make sure things like a vitamin A aren't going out of whack, right? Because we know that there's tons of vitamin A in liver. Um, I think that's, you know, just having a few servings a week. I don't think it needs to be every single day. Yeah, I think a lot of people feel this need to really take a lot of these things every day and, and all the supplements. I mean, that's great. The supplements are fine if you really just can't 
handle eating the organ meats. But yeah, that's where you have to be a little careful. Um, one thing I do for some of my clients, this is a tip for your listeners too, that um, if you have, if you can get um, a really lovely, you know, regenerative grass fed beef liver, um, cut it up, lay it out and cut it up into little tiny pill sized chunks and um, lay it on a cookie sheet and freeze it. Freeze it for a couple of weeks. They say a couple of weeks kills all the parasites that could potentially be in there. Um, and just put it in a jar, take it off the cookie sheet, put it in a jar and just pop a couple of those every day, raw, raw liver. And you don't, uh, maybe you've heard of that before. I think that's a really great tip just to get a little bit of organ meat in your diet every day, like just little bits, if you're not going to eat it on a routine basis, you know? Um, yeah, I just don't think it needs to be a tremendous amount, but again, it really yeah. depends. If I see no. someone's micronutrient tests and they're way deficient in vitamin A, like they probably need a lot more liver than most of us. Yeah. Interesting. No, that's exactly how I do it. I'll go in phases where like, um, I'll do it every day and then I'll, I'll maybe go a few months where I don't have any at all. But if I do it, that's typically how I'll do it is keep it in the freezer, cut them up into small chunks and you just throw two or three down the hatch and you're kind of covered and feel good. And like, it, you don't even taste it like an interesting way to approach it. And I love, I love your answer. And going back to Dr. Bill Schindler, he answered this question really similarly on another podcast recently, where he mm. said, like, think about the proportion of the animal, you are going to get a lot more of the muscle meat, there's not very many organs, there's one liver for that entire, you know, animal and you might get a few bites versus getting several pounds of the muscle meat and just think about it in that way and i think that's a really smart way to approach it so i really appreciate your answer there yeah yeah and i mean if you're utilizing the whole animal too everyone's going to get a little bit of heart everyone's going to get a little bit of liver and spleen you know i mean i i haven't been that adventurous with some of my organ meats i haven't tried spleen before and i've had sweet breads which i really love um and certainly heart but you know you can get them all blended up in the ground meat if you don't want to taste them i think kidney is horrible <laughs> <laughs> but you know everyone kind of has their favorites and so yeah i mean it's kind of like listening to your body and just really you know don't force yourself to eat anything that's just you know nauseating and it is hard to like mentally get past some of these things that we just weren't raised with but yeah, yeah. i think that his answer is yeah feels very in alignment with what yeah. i think what would you so cost? interesting if, if we're getting back to your work and you're dealing again with your patients, you're also dealing with farms, farmers, how, how does it, how, how can we support both planetary health and our own personal health by eating in this way and getting to know our farmers? Oh, well, I mean, it, there's so many resources I like to give, um, in order to just just find farmers. I mean, one really simple way of finding a farm in your area is just like go on Google and search in your area, regenerative farm for your area. Like I go on Google maps and did that. That's how I did set up a lot of my farm tours and just find, you know, and I'll just drive throughout a bunch of different States and like go to all these regenerative farms, but find someone in your area and connect with them, go to their farm, have conversations with them, take your family out there. Like that is just to me that the number one thing we can do. And for people that just don't have access to that, if you're in a big city and it's a few hours away, um, you know, the, there's other options. I love 1000ecofarms.com, I think is what's called 1000 Eco Farms. Are you aware of that website? I'm not. It's amazing. We'll tag that in the show notes. Oh, please. It's, it's, I love it. Um, I, my good friend, Liz Reitzig has a, um, buying club in this area, in the Maryland, Virginia, DC area, um, Pennsylvania, you go online, you buy all your stuff from all these different farmers in the area. She does all the hard work. She goes around, picks them all up, drives for all, all these States, and then drops it off at a drop point for you nearby. That's like maybe 20, 30 minutes from your house tops. So, and, and they're, they're all over the place. There's no fee to sign up. You just pay the delivery fee and the processing fee and which is very minimal. And it's amazing. It cut, it saves you time. You're not going to a store. So if you can't get to a farmer's market, if you can't go to a farm, there's a lot of these like little kind of um, food hubs and things like that, that help people really connect and, you know, and then just, just educate yourself and just spread the word as much as possible. Like really you know, talk to everyone, you know, about regenerative agriculture, watch the movie, tell them to watch the movie, kiss the ground and, you know, and just to support the work of all these organizations and these farmers. Yeah. What are some surprising ways that regenerative farming actually helps restore the health of the planet? Well, I mean, certainly the carbon sequestration aspect of things, right. I mean, that's, that's huge. That was like such a, a big, um, I don't know, like a just epiphany or a amazing realization for me that, 
yeah, more, we need more animals on the land, a lot more, like so many more. And people think that's totally insane. Of course, you've had um, Nicolette Hahn Nyman on your show and her book. She just, I'm actually reading through her, um, her updated expanded version of Defending Beef. It's really good. It is so good. I mean, just like the first couple chapters, I'm like, holy crap, like it's so much, it's so much information, so much misunderstandings about, you know, the carbon cycle and, you know, the biogenic carbon cycle. And, and this is a natural carbon cycle. The methane issue is so overblown. And it's a really like, it's a lot of the fossil fuel industries that are just blaming agriculture for, you know, it's very convenient for them to do that, right? To blame agriculture for all the fossil fuel emissions, CO, uh, greenhouse gas emissions rather. So yeah, I mean, just, just that and, and the ability of animals to restore ecosystems like throughout all my ecological work and conservation work you know even I thought animals on the land were bad right and in some cases they are if you're not managing your animals properly and they're overgrazing and you know you're not regenerating land that way um, and that can have detrimental impacts then and unfortunately there's not enough regenerative farmers there's a lot of grass-fed farmers ranchers right but they're not regenerative. So that is a very, very important distinction that just because you're buying from a grass-fed farmer doesn't mean they're utilizing regenerative practices. And it's not to come down on those farmers, but they certainly, um, we want them to learn, you know, that there's other methods to, to holistically raise your animals to restore the land. So yeah. seeing biodiversity in the Audubon Society and that whole thing, like encouraging conservation ranching, like that is all just the beauty of regenerative agriculture. That's that great. Blows my mind. No, that's that's great. And it does seem like now, even more so than I would say maybe like five years ago, from the limited amount of knowledge I have about the subject, it seems like it is more approachable now than it ever has been. There are resources yeah. for people that want to do this, even conventional farmers just moving in totally. that direction. It seems like like it's way more approachable now than it ever has been. Understanding ag, like huge shout out to them. I've you know done webinars and done some of their um, field school like uh, presentations at their workshops and they're amazing. They are doing so, so much tremendous amount of work to help conventional farmers make this, you know, this uh, transition, you know, this transformation into regenerative agriculture. So I, I, I love them dearly. Understanding Ag is a very important resource for those farmers too. So cool. Yeah, that's so cool. I absolutely love that. Well, what have we missed in this conversation? We've covered a lot of ground today. Is there anything that we missed as, as far as this conversation goes, especially as it comes to gut health? Oh, man, um, there's always so much more I can say about gut health. <laughs> but here's what I'm going to do. If you want to turn on the screen sharing again real quick, I'm just going to pop up this amazing diagram. Have you heard of Megaspore probiotic? No. It's, it's an amazing spore-based probiotic that I love. They do some fantastic research um, on their specific strains of bacteria, wow. their exact products. But anyway, this is like the whole complex world that's going on. Okay. And I'm not going to talk about this because we only have a few minutes left, but um, I just want people to understand like, you know, healing the gut isn't just fixing leaky gut or taking a probiotic. Like there's a lot going on in here in this mucosal tissue and getting the immune system back in balance. But, you know, this is just such a beautiful diagram that microbiome labs put together of a healthy gut versus leaky gut. And I really just show this to everyone to give them kind of like a visual of like, how complex this all is and all the different wow. layers that we go through with healing. But anyway, just, just something to keep in mind for, for people um, that, you know, yeah, I love that. Listen, that is a very complex thing. <laughs> yeah, definitely. If you're listening to this episode, be sure to go check this out on YouTube because the visuals that you presented have been really, really cool. That, that one right there was amazing. Awesome. Thank you. And I'll have links to, to different presentations, like on my website, where I pull up a lot of these diagrams and kind of like bring it all together as like a wow. more cohesive sort of message. But yeah. Wow. Yeah. Like awesome. I yeah. Well, that's fantastic, Sarah. It's always such a pleasure to talk to you. I know we're always going to cover something very interesting. You're nice. always invited back if you ever want to come back and talk about whatever you have going on at the moment, Thank which always you. seems to be quite a bit. In fact, today, just today, you launched your website, which is super cool. Um, yeah, it's great. It looks really yeah. good. Very well done. I love the pictures on there. Um, but yeah, if you don't mind, tell the audience where they can go to find you and connect with you and your work. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's uh, eco-nutrition.com um, or my name, Sarah, without an H, um, Keo, K-E-O-U-G-H.com. <laughs> um, Eco Nutrition's easier, obviously. Um, yeah, I just launched it today. Uh, Soul Camp Creative was the, the team that was absolutely amazing. So I just wanted to give them a little shout out because they were just phenomenal. I mean, just from beginning to end, such an amazing team. They did a beautiful job. 
Um, but of course, I, I did most of the content and that took forever. So I've been working on this for months. So yes, I'm excited to have launched it today. And you're my, my first you know podcast interview since launching it. So cool. I talk about my, my work and just my story and people can learn more about Regenv Agriculture. There's going to be a resource library at some point. I don't have that page up yet, but it's going to be articles and just where people can learn more and just, you know, you know, some tools to, to help get them even started on their journey of like health and wellness and wow. when it comes to nourishing that inner ecosystem. So. That's amazing. Well, that's just going to help so many people. I, so many people are struggling with this right now. It's it's so yeah. pervasive through through the population that people have digestive issues and are not paying attention to gut health. So I really appreciate what you've been able to educate us with today. Lots of nuance and different things to think about. And I love how um, deep you get into this and how comprehensive you make this with all your testing and everything else you're doing. We just really appreciate you and your work. And thank you so very much for taking time to be on our show today. We really appreciate you. Thank you for all you do and having like so many amazing guests as well. And I'm just honored to be part of them and, and all that you're doing. So thank you. You rock. Well, absolutely. <laughs> thank you very much. And it is just such an honor to host you. It's been great. Thanks, Casey. Thank you. And this has been another episode of Balanced Body Radio.